The Lord be with you. <laughs> I love Catholics. <laughs> Sorry, my wife just texted me. She's flirting with me. She's gonna come. She said, you're sexy. I said, okay. <laughs> Hold on a second, just one second. I know, okay. Just kidding, I didn't say that. I'm not a dead man. Okay. So my wife and I, we were actually watching a horror movie the other night. Uh, it's called The Notebook. Maybe you're familiar with it. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you see, here's, here's something you guys have to understand. For those of you uh, who maybe are called to the sacrament of holy matrimony one day, it's really good to learn this, okay? And for those of you who are married, you already understand this. When you get married, whatever she likes, you like. And whatever you like, it doesn't matter. So I grew, I grew up with a bunch of brothers, and I loved horror movies. I mean, I loved horror movies. And my wife's like, I don't like horror movies. Not before bed. I'm like, well, how about 7 o'clock in the morning? No, it's too gory. It's too gross. Uh. I'm like, how about sci-fi? You know? No, it's not realistic. I'm like, okay, but a world where Ryan Gosling can't find a girlfriend is realistic? <laughs> Whatever. So when I was a kid, you don't understand, like, there was these movies, and the adults, the chaperones will understand this a lot more than some of you guys will. There was movies that could just scare you within an inch of your life. There was this movie called Poltergeist. And there's this part where this kid's, like, in his bed, and it's storming outside, and he's, like, there's, like, a doll, like, this creepy doll, like an it kind of clown, you know, like, Pennywise, like, over on the corner, and the lightning flashes, and he sees the doll. And the lightning flashes again, and the doll's gone, and you're like, <laughs> And all of a sudden, he looks under the bed, and, ah! and you're just like, I'm going I'm, I'm to need a new spleen. Okay? There's this movie called Jaws. Okay? Jaws was amazing. Ja Steven Spielberg, he made this movie, and I'm not even kidding you, everybody in the country, even people living in Kansas, were afraid of sharks. Okay? I mean, I wouldn't even go. I'm like, I'm not going in the swimming pool. I'm not going in the bathtub. There's not a great white in the bathtub. You don't know, Mom. You don't know. It was so scary. It was the best. And, I'm like, and like now I'm like my nephews, you know, now my kids are like, oh, this is so fake. This looks so fake. The special effects suck. I'm like, oh. oh. Oh, look at me. I got Avatar. I got CGI. Yeah, we had Avatar too. It's called the Smurfs. Shut up. Anyway. But you know what I love about a horror movie, like a really good horror movie, is that a good director can make you freak out in the safety of your own couch in your own home. You ever been watching that movie, right? Maybe like the lights are off, you're watching the movie, and you're watching this, and you start talking to the screen. You're like, hey, no, 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 don't go in there, don't go in there, don't go in there, look! They can't not look! But you start talking to it, you're like, what's that sound? That's the ice maker, it goes off every 30 seconds. You're gonna be fine. And horror movies are so beautifully predictable. It's like, okay, let's get some teeny boppers and head out into the woods, and everybody's going to get naked, and everybody's going to get dead. Right? But you know, you also know what's going to happen. Like, there's a hero, and he's like, I play football. And there's like, then there's like the girlfriend, she's like, I'm a moron. <laughs> and she comes up, and she's like, oh, look at me, I'm wearing denim panties, or whatever, you know what I mean? Like, she's just not dressed appropriately. And then there's always this one friend. They don't even give the kid a name. He's just like wearing flippers and carrying a cooler. He's like, hey, wait for me, guys. You're like, yep, he's going to die first. It's always the kid without the name that dies first. You know what's going to happen, right? But inevitably, there's always this scene in the horror movie, and everyone's gone. And there's maybe, like, maybe some like, girl is like, hello? Billy? I'm all alone. And the phone line's dead. And there's no electricity. I'm hitting the lights. There's this red gooey substance everywhere. I'm not sure what it is. And all the kitchen knives are missing. Okay, I'm gonna come investigate. You're gonna die. You're talking to the screen, you're like, yeah, you're seriously going to die. And actually being that stupid, you kinda of deserve to. I'm just kidding. God loves stupid people too. So here's the thing. That's not how fear works. You see, when you're afraid of something, you're not like, I'm gonna go investigate. No, when you're afraid, you're like, <laughs> I'm gonna barricade myself in the basement with the gun. When you're afraid, you don't charge forward. When you're afraid, you back up. First time I went skydiving. I'm up in the plane. We're like you know, thousands of feet over the, over the ground. The plane door's open. I walk over. I'm like, why did I pay to do this? This is a perfectly good airplane. Why did I pay to? And why am I wearing a helmet? Because if that chute doesn't open, the helmet's not going to help you. Okay? 
So I'm standing there, and the, and the, 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 the instructor guy, I've been through this whole day of instruction. I'm sitting there, I got my chute, I got my little helmet, I'm ready, I'm standing there, and all of a sudden I start to look like Elvis. You know, like after like six monster Red Bulls, I'm like, what's going on? Why is my leg shaking? And I couldn't move forward. I was so nervous. I'm in the door of the plane. I'm just like, I'm going to die, I'm going to die, I'm going to die. I'm going to see Jesus today. I didn't want to see the day. And I'm singing to myself. I'm freaking out. And the instructor's like, okay, Mark, go for it. And I'm like, yeah, okay, just a second. Okay, Mark, you got it. Okay, yeah, thanks very much, Doug. Okay, shut up. I got it. <laughs> Mark, yeah, well, I, I got it. I got it. I got it. Stand in there. Stand, I'm so nervous. He goes, and then he looks at me. He tries to be all profound. And he grabs my shoulders, looks me right in the eyes. He goes, Mark, there's no I in fear. Way to go, Webster. You know what I mean? Like, I look back, I'm like, yeah, but there's two eyes, an idiot. <laughs> jump out to me, planes, Doug. <laughs> I'm so nervous, I'm so, so afraid. And I'm about to jump out, and I'm like, what am I doing? I've got a wife and kids and a mortgage and a job. I'm going to voluntarily jump out of a perfectly good aircraft. I am an idiot. <laughs> now all of a sudden, like, your whole life flashes before your eyes. You're like, okay. Because when you're afraid, you're like, I don't want to move forward. I want to move back. And I want to say, as this weekend gets going, I'm really proud of you. And I genuinely, I know speaking on behalf of the entire speaking team, all the chaperones, all the priests, all the volunteers, everybody who spent days and weeks and months planning this, we are all happy that you're here and we're proud of you for being here. I'm going to tell you specifically, I am proud of you for being here. When I was 16, before I knew the Lord, I never would have had the guts to come to something like this. I never would have had the courage to come to something like this. I would not have been charging forward into the room, charging forward towards the stage, charging forward towards Jesus or in my faith. I would have been hanging out in the back as far as I could. That's where all the good Catholics sit. <laughs> Just hanging in the back, holding up the wall. I would never would have had the courage to come to something like this. And I mean this sincerely. I'm really proud of you. If I'm proud of you, I can't imagine how proud God the Father is that you're here. And it's not an accident that you're here. Maybe you're like, I thought we were going to space camp. They just put me on a, on a bus and they gave me a neon t-shirt. What the crap is this? Is this like a Jesus concert and stuff? <laughs> but honestly, I'll tell you, like, I'm so proud of you for being here. I'm so thankful you're here. I can't imagine. I can't imagine how your Father in heaven feels to have you here because you could be anywhere else. Time is your greatest commodity. If you really think about it, every second that you live... Time becomes more precious because you're one second closer to dying, one second closer to meeting the Lord. Every second matters, but every second is more valuable than the last. And the fact that you're spending your time here is a big, big deal. And how do I know that the Father is so happy to have you here? Because you are his sons and daughters. By virtue of your baptism, you're not just a creation. You're not just a, 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 a beast. You're not a slave. You're a child of God. You're a son of God. You're a daughter of God. Now, I know most of you are not married. Most of you don't have kids. But I'll tell you something, like, I have four kids. I have three beautiful daughters, so I'm not going to show you their pictures. Because <laughs> you're not allowed to see them because they're beautiful. Right? And I have a little boy, a little five-year-old boy. And I'll never forget when he first came. Okay? Yeah, I know, seriously, right? No. But I'll never forget, like, when you have a child and you're so afraid about everything. Like the first time you had a kid, I was so nervous. When you have your first child, you're like, everywhere they go, you're like, oh, you're going to fall. Oh, you're going to fall. You baby-proof everything. You move all the furniture out of your house. You basically live like you're a squatter in a stolen house. Okay? And you move everything out because you're so afraid. And the next kid comes, you loosen up a little bit. Next kid comes, you loosen up a little bit. First kid, the, 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 the thing, the binky falls out of their mouth. You're like, oh, i got to boil it in hot water and buy new ones. By the fourth kid, you're like, uh, is it cow manure? It's fine. It's fine. It's here. Dog poop, it's fine. It's probably fine here. But you're still nervous, you're still afraid because when you look at your child, you wanna protect them from everything. And you wanna teach them everything. You wanna teach them how to walk, you wanna teach them how to talk. You spend the first two years as a parent trying to get them to stand up and talk and walk, and the next 16 years telling them to sit down and shut up. <laughs> you're like, that's my dad. <laughs> but you wanna teach them everything, right? And then you watch them and they grow. And it's amazing as they grow. You get to just dress him up and take him in public and be a, just be ridiculous. And he gets me into so much trouble. My son has almost got me into so many fights, you have no idea. He couldn't, he, 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 we were getting out of the grocery and he wanted to take his bear with him out of the car, okay, a couple years ago. But he couldn't say bear, he'd say beer, beer. And I said, no, no beer, we're not bringing beer, no beer. So we go to the grocery and we're going through the liquor store and he's in the car and he's like, I want beer, I want beer. And I'm like... 
All these people looking at me like, bad daddy. Right? We're at Ash Wednesday a couple years ago. And he walks forward and the deacon is holding the bowl of ashes and he goes down to make the sign of the cross of the ashes. My son looks up and he grabs the deacon's hand and smacks the bowl out of it. And I'm like, it's my boy. <laughs> what do you do? How do you get out of that? And then this is the worst, okay? So you have to watch what you're saying when you're driving around. I saw this parent, and they're in a car with like two or three little kids. The windows are rolled up, and this parent is chain smoking. The car's filled with smoke. And I made a mistake to say out loud, I'm like, what an idiot. That guy is an idiot. And I'm, I mean, it was not my most Christian moment. Hey, don't judge. <laughs> not my most Christian moment, right? And I wasn't thinking I was paying attention. Two weeks later, I'm at a stoplight. Just listen to the music. And because the music is on, I didn't hear my son, who's in the car seat sitting behind me, put the window down. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I hear him say, hey, you're an idiot. <laughs> and I'm like, dude? He's like, and then he's shouting, you're an idiot, out the window. And I look over, and there's like this 280-pound biker <laughs> on a Harley with a lit cigarette, and he's looking at me. <laughs> and I'm like, and I'm an idiot, too. He gets me in so much trouble, it's great. But he's really, really cute. And you know what's great, it's like when you're a parent, you take him places, you know, and they interact, you watch him grow, and you reach down, they grab your hand, and then we were getting out of the car a couple weeks ago, we get in the parking lot. I get out, I go, hey buddy, come on. He goes, okay daddy, he's got all his Hot Wheels. I go to put my hand down, you know what he did? Pulled it away. A little crap. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> He pulled it away. And I was like, what happened? Like, what happens? When, when is it that we start to pull away? Like, think back to when you're a kid, okay? Now, whether you have a great relationship with your earthly father, or whether it's no relationship at all, or whether it's so-so, it's, it's, it's okay, maybe it's hot and cold, it's up and down, whatever it is. I don't know what your situation is. I only know what my situation is. And I always had a really hard relationship with my father. But when you think back to those early memories, think back to your mom or to your dad, Think back to the time that you were so vulnerable. You were so vulnerable in a parking lot or in a mall, in a grocery, and you reach up and you grab their hand. And they want to take your hand. They want to protect you. We were in a mall about a year ago, and my wife thought I was watching him, and, and I thought she was watching him. And we, just, we miscommunicated, and he was hiding underneath a rack of clothes. For, for about 15 minutes, we couldn't find him in this mall. And I've never been so scared in my life. I mean, my heart's just beating out of my chest, frantically looking for him, calling his name, calling his name, calling his name. And he thought it'd be really funny not to answer. <laughs> but it was so scary. Because when you're a parent, all you want is to know where your child is and to know where your child's going and to protect them and to care for them and to love them. And some of you guys, you might have a really hard time believing that because maybe you have a strained relationship with your parents right now. I always love when I watch teens drive away and, and the parents always say, hey, you know what? Be careful. And you're like, I know. I know. Oh, I'm so sorry that your life and safety matter to me. I know. I love you. I know. Oh, the burden of my love. I'm so sorry. You seem to love me when you need an ATM. I'm here to tell you something, okay? Do you know why your parents say, be careful? I trust you, I just don't trust the, the people you hang out with, the other people. You're not an idiot, but your friends are. <laughs> right? You know why parents care? You know they tell you to drive carefully, be careful, fasten your seatbelt, text me when you get there, please get home, don't be late. You know why? Because every minute you're gone, we lose our minds. Because we love you. Because you matter to us. Because your life matters to us. There's parents that were plotting and scheming for years to get you here because your eternal life matters to us. Your soul matters to us. That's why we all get on planes and that's why all these people hang these lights and all these volunteers show up in these t-shirts because your soul matters. And even if it doesn't matter to you, even if you don't even realize it yet, even if you're afraid to take that step out of fear, to step forward in your faith, to step forward towards God, if you're afraid to pray, to put your hand up to God, even if you're afraid, God's not. He's got you. He's got you. But you see, God wants that relationship with you. You know, when he created you, he didn't just say, I'm the creator, you're the creation. 
and say, I'm the slave and you're the master. You're like beast of burden. No, he says, you're my son. You're my daughter by virtue of your baptism. This beautiful line, Mark chapter one, verse 11. Jesus gets baptized in the River Jordan. It says he comes out of the water in 111 and says the sky is torn open and a voice came from the heavens, you are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. And I remember the first time I heard that when I was a teenager, I probably heard it before but I never listened to Mass. The first time I heard that reading, I was like, oh, okay, it's a story about God talking about Jesus because Jesus is his kid. But I never actually stopped to consider, but you know what? By virtue of the baptism, your baptism, you're God's son, you're God's daughter. And when you hear that verse, do you know what you're supposed to do? You're supposed to ask yourself, do I really believe this? Do I really believe that I'm God's beloved son? You see, because of your baptism, because of Jesus Christ, you are now the son of God, the daughter of God. You're in the family. Do I really, really believe that, that I'm God's child? Do I really believe that he's pleased with me? Because I guarantee you right now, there are souls in this room, and not just teenagers, there are souls in this room who are adults who don't believe it. There are souls in this room right now who do not believe that God can forgive your sins, or that you sin too much and you've run too far and you've, you've done too many things. That you seem to somehow believe because maybe you struggle with a specific sin or particular sin, you can't seem to kick the habit or the addiction, whatever it is, that God can't forgive you, he won't forgive you, he's tired of forgiving you, and that is a lie from the bowels of hell. That's a lie. There's not one sin, not one, that God won't forgive except the sin you don't ask forgiveness for because you're too scared or too prideful. That God is waiting this weekend, he's waiting to restore that relationship. He's waiting to forgive that sin. When you pray, when you go forward for the Eucharist, you go forward to confession, it's like you're putting that hand out to the Father again. And you're allowing God the Father to reach down at Mass. He's reaching down and he's grabbing you by the hand. Reconciliation, he's taking you by the hand. He's saying, you did it your way. And it's dangerous out there. And I want to protect you and I want to save you and I want to love you. But you got to let me in. But you know what ends up happening? You see, as we get older and we start to lose our innocence, we make bad decisions, we're tempted, we sin. And the more we sin, the more quiet we get. I can always tell my kids are sinning at home. Do you know how? It's quiet. If I'm in my house, I'm next to my wife on the couch. And I'll be like, shh, you hear that? She's like, I don't hear anything. I'm like, exactly. There's sin happening. <laughs> you see, when you're a parent, you understand this premise. When it gets quiet, your kids are sinning. When they're making noise, they're not even thinking about it. But it's like, shh, don't do it too loud. Oh, oh sin, 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 sin. <laughs> and the same thing happens in your prayer life. Do you know what you do when you start sinning? You stop talking to God. You go quiet. Maybe you stop going to Mass. Maybe you stop praying. You stop talking to God. You stop listening. Because when sin happens, all of a sudden we were covered in our guilt and our shame. We become very, very aware that, yeah, maybe I'm a son of God, maybe I'm a daughter of God, but I have sinned and dad is mad. Dad's not going to forgive me, and that's a lie. Do you know what happens when you don't pray? When you don't pray, first thing that happens, you begin to doubt God's presence. You, you begin to doubt that God is actually present, that he's paying attention. It's like you're that, you're that character in the horror movie. You're like, I'm just going to run out into danger because I'm a moron. I'm already sinned. Like God's not looking, like God's in heaven going, oh, okay, I can't look. I can't look, okay, I can't not look. Like God's up in heaven in his like lazy God recliner, like. When you stop praying, you will doubt that God is present. You'll doubt that he's present to you, he's paying attention to you, he even cares about you. When you stop praying, second step, you begin to doubt God's promises to you. You'll doubt God's promises to you. A promise like Isaiah 41 says, fear not for I am with you. Be not dismayed for I am your God and I will lift you up with my right arm out of the pit. There's 4,000 promises in these 73 books, 4,000. The promise that he gives us the most, the command that he gives us the most in scripture, do not fear. Fear not, do not fear, do not be afraid. No command occurs more in scripture than do not fear. Why? Because he knows what we're gonna do. When we sin, he knows we're gonna hide. He knows we're going to run. He knows we're going to go silent. And he wants to restore that relationship through confession. He wants to restore that relationship. That's why he died on a cross. He's not willing to abandon you. He's not the dad that abandons you. He's the dad that no matter how many times you screw up, he's still there to pick you up. No matter how many times you pull your arm down, he's still extending his down. Still wanting to take you by the hand. Why? Because he loves you. He loves you more than you love him. He loves you more than you love yourself. He loves you more than anyone could possibly fathom. But see, but when you stop praying, what happens? What happens? You doubt his presence, you doubt his promises, and then you doubt his faithfulness. 
See, because when you're not praying, you're not in that relationship. You're not listening. You're not hearing. You're not talking. You're not sharing. You're not bearing your heart. You start to say, you know what? He's not going to be faithful. He's not going to be here for me. Not like she will be. Not like he will be. Not like this will be. Not this temptation. Not this addiction. Not this alcohol. Not this drug. Not this broken relationship. Not this pornography. He's not going to be here for me. But all these other things are. I have to fill this void somehow. And we, start, we start to believe that God isn't going to be faithful to us. You see what ends up happening? I don't pray, so all of a sudden, he's not really present to me. I can't trust his promises. He's not going to be faithful. Then you start to doubt that God's even good. Well, if, if God was good, why does all this bad stuff happen? If God is good, why, 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 how, how can he let me go through this? How can he let me go through that? We start to believe that any kind of suffering must mean that God doesn't love us. We start to doubt not just the presence of God, the promise of God, the faithfulness of God, but the very goodness of God. And when you doubt the goodness of God, you know the next logical step, and this again, this is what happens when you don't pray. If you doubt the goodness of God, you know what you're gonna do? Now you're gonna doubt God's love. I'm not lovable. And that's when Satan really gets in and puts his claws in, man. He gets you to believe that you are not lovable, you are not forgivable. He's gonna get into your ear, I guarantee you. There's, there are souls in this room that need confession, that need that mercy of God. The most beautiful three words you're gonna hear in the history of creation is not I love you, it's I absolve you. I absolve you. The most beautiful words a priest can utter, the most beautiful words in all of history and all of creation, I absolve you. And there are souls in this room that desperately need that mercy and desperately need that love. But you know what? The devil wants you nowhere near that confessional. He wants you nowhere near the sacraments. He wants you nowhere near the grace. He's going to get into your ear. He's going to say, you sin too much. You can't handle this life. You can't handle this temptation. You can't handle this addiction. You can't handle this storm. And that's when you look back by virtue of your baptism and say, I'm a son of God. I'm a daughter of God. I've got the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ flowing through my veins. I'm empowered by the Catholic Church. I can't handle the storm. I am the storm. I am the storm. But you have to believe in the love of God. You have to trust in the love of God. That no matter how bad you sin, no matter how far you run, the shepherd runs faster and the shepherd runs farther. And the shepherd, my brothers and my sisters, sons and daughters, the shepherd's coming for you this weekend because he wants that relationship. Because the father's gonna stop at nothing to protect his children because you belong to him. You're not your own. It says in St. Paul's letter, you're not your own. You're purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. That you're not a child of this world. You're a child of heaven. You're a child made for the next world. You are made for greatness. And so many of us, we're so afraid to live that we're not actually really living. We're just breathing. We're so afraid what's going to happen. What's someone going to say? What's someone going to think? We allow everybody else's opinion to dictate how we live. We allow someone's stupid comment or lack thereof on Instagram or on Snapchat to affect how we look at ourselves. We allow people to have so much power. We give our power away. Instead of finding our identity in heaven and saying, my, 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 father is li- my father's God. My father is God. Even if my earthly father is not perfect, my heavenly father is. But if you don't pray, you're going to doubt the love of God. And sooner or later, if you don't pray, you're going to doubt the existence of God. You start to look around and say, ah, I don't even know. And then all of a sudden, you get swept right away. Well, if you're not praying, you'll get swept away by this world. Whoever has the most convincing argument in 140 to 280 characters, whoever has the most convincing argument, the pithiest, funniest thing to say, you will get swept away by this world. My brothers and my sisters, here's the reality, okay? Here's the reality. God, your father, God, your father, this whole weekend is just reaching down. He's reaching his hand down to you. And he's saying, I got you. I got you, but you got to take my hand. I got you, but you got to take my hand. You got to stop hiding. I'm calling your name, and you got to stop hiding because I love you, and I want to protect you, and I want to save you, but you got to stop running, and you got to stop hiding, and you better start praying because, you know what, I'd be willing to bet a lot of people in this room, you've been trying it your way, and your way isn't working. Maybe your way's not working. Maybe you sought to replace the love that only God can give you in a really broken relationship. Maybe you sought to, re- to, to replace that love in, in, in pornography or in some kind of an addiction. Maybe you sought to replace that love by just earthly accomplishments. Maybe you're working so hard to make everybody else happy that the only one who you really truly should be desiring to make happy, the one in heaven, is just sitting and waiting as we go through life. Or maybe, just maybe, you're, you're hanging back and you're just scared to move forward. 
Maybe you think that you are just too big a sinner, too horrible a sinner for God ever to forgive, for God ever to use. Your chaperones, they are living proof that God uses sinners. Horrible, awful sin. I'm just kidding. <laughs> God made saints out of far worse people than you. I'm going to say that again. God made saints out of far worse people than you. Page after page in the Gospels, you know who Jesus goes to? I mean, the first people to come and worship him are shepherds. Shepherds had the worst reputation in society. They smelled like sheep. They didn't have great social skills. He goes and calls Matthew, who's a tax collector. Those guys used to, used to skim off the top. They used to literally take the money out of, say, say, like Simon Peter and Andrew and James and John. They would take extra money out of their own pockets. They hated him. Do you imagine how angry Simon and Andrew, James and John were when Jesus walks up and invites this tax collector into the original boy band? Are you kidding me right now? Jesus, he reaches out to the lepers, to the prostitutes, to the women caught in adultery. He reaches out to Gentiles. Gentiles were loathed. You might think that you're some horrible, awful sinner. I'm telling you what, you go study the Catholic Church, there is a sinner, that's, there's saints that got you beat. Saint Olga? Yeah, Saint Olga? Yeah, she was a princess in Russia, and she was a mass murderer! Yeah, she was married to the Prince of Kiev, and he was assassinated, and she found out who did it, so she invited all of them. They came to the castle. They were going to try and take over her kingdom. She says, okay, come to the castle tomorrow, husband's murderers, and she had all of her, all of the people at the castle. They dug a huge hole, a huge hole, and when all the guys who were behind her husband's death got there, she had them all pushed into the hole and buried alive. Way to go, Olga. Oh, but it gets better. You know what happened the next day? She invited the rest of the ambassadors, who were the enemy, back to the castle. And when they got there, she had them all escorted into this nice banquet room. And then they locked the doors and they set it on fire. Oh, and then after that, it gets even better. Right? After that, she lured like hundreds more soldiers to the castle. So we had this big party. She got them all drunk. Then she sent her army in and they slayed all of them. They figured by the time St. Olga was done, seven to eight hundred people had been murdered and it wasn't until a decade later when she heard the gospel in Constantinople. And when Olga heard the gospel, she heard about the mercy of God and the love of God the Father, a God she had never known before. She gave her life to Jesus Christ. She gave her life to the church. We now call her a saint. Now, I don't think anybody here is a mass murderer. I'm willing to bet. That probably should have showed up on your form. Okay? We need to know that kind of stuff. You might think you're the worst sinner that's ever walked the planet. You might think that you don't deserve to be called a son of God. You don't deserve to be called a daughter of God. You might be so filled with fear right now that you're afraid to take that step forward. You might be so filled with fear right now, you're like, look, I don't even know why I'm here. Mark, I don't know why I'm here, dude. I'm just kind of, I'm here. But I'm afraid to take that step. And if, and if that's where you're at, if you're honest about that, I respect that. Remember, I started by saying I never would have had the courage to come to something like this when I was 16, before I was walking with the Lord. I never would have. But I'll tell you something. And I'm saying this as a dad, okay? As a dad. I look at my daughters and my son every day, and I tell them how much I love them and how beautiful they are, and they can do anything. They can do anything in the world. That they are loved by God, and nothing they ever do is gonna make me love them less. Nothing they ever do. And I am so imperfect and so earthly, I can't even imagine, I can't even wrap my head around how much your heavenly Father loves you. And if that's really hard for you to hear, that you have a father who loves you because of maybe something's going on with your own earthly dad, then on his behalf, allow me to say this. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry if you haven't heard from your dad that he's proud of you or that you're beautiful or that you're loved or that he, that he, that he desires great things for you. I'm sorry if you don't have that relationship where you felt protected. I'm sorry if you don't have that relationship where maybe you, you, you share space in a room but you never talk. So on behalf of, of dads, of, of dads all over the place, good dads and dads who are struggling and dads who have failed, on behalf of all of them, I'm sorry. But do not, do not allow that hurt and that brokenness to keep you from the love of God the Father. Do not let the failures of earthly parents dictate how close you get to God this weekend. You are a son of the living God, men. Ladies, you're a daughter of the living God. And if you are in that place in your life right now, maybe you've been walking with the Lord, maybe you've never even given a second thought to God, but if you're in that place right now, whether you've come to a bunch of these and maybe you've fallen, or you're, you've been coming to these and maybe you're going through the motions, maybe you're having one of those doubts about God's goodness or faithfulness or his love or his mercy, 
Or if you're in that place where you're like, Mark, I'm, just, I'm tired, man. I've been trying to do this thing my way and my way's not working. And I need something new, I need something different, but I'm scared. God can work with that. Fear not. You fear not this weekend. You are a son of God. You are a daughter of God by virtue of your baptism. And when you pray, when we worship, you just open your hands, you extend a hand to God, and you trust that when you draw near to God, it says in James, the book of James says, when you draw near to God, God's gonna draw near to you. He's gonna reach down to you. And silently, without looking at your neighbors, this isn't about the person next to you. I don't care if you're an adult, I don't care if you're a teen. If you're in that place right now, where you're ready to take that step out of the plane, to take a step forward, to do something new. If you're gonna allow God into your life in a new way right now, to allow Jesus into your life and into your heart in a new way tonight, this weekend. If you're in a place where you've tried it your way and it's time to give it to God, to spiritually extend that hand to the Father, if you're in that place right now where you're willing to go there, you're willing to give it to God, I'm gonna invite you silently, silently, wherever you're seated, just to stand where you are as a sign to God. I'm gonna invite you to stand. If you're in that place, I invite you to stand right now, wherever you are. But God, I'm open. God, I'm here. God, I'm ready to go there this weekend. God, I'm sorry for my sins. I'm sorry for the decisions I've made. I'm sorry for my failures. But God, I trust that you are a good father. I trust that you got me. I trust that you got my hand. I just want you to take a second, just close your eyes. Maybe you open your hands just in front of you or extend a hand to the heavens, extend a hand to God. And just silently in your heart, just say, God, I love you. Say, God, I need you. Say, God, thank you for never giving up on me. And God, I'm scared. I don't know what's next. I don't know what's going to happen next. I don't know what the next step's going to entail. I don't know about my future. I don't know about school or vocation or job. I don't know, God. All I know is that wherever you are, that's where I want to be. And I need you, God. If you're going to give God permission to do something new in your heart tonight and new in your heart this weekend, you just say it in your heart right now. You just say, Holy Spirit, I give you permission. Holy Spirit, I give you permission. Jesus, I give you permission. God, I want you to sit on the throne of my heart. God, I want you to be the Lord of my life. I want you to reign over my life, God. Jesus, I give you permission. Holy Spirit, I give you permission to lead me where you want to lead me, to take me where you want to take me, God, help me to see myself as you see me. Help me to see myself as your son. Help me to see myself as your daughter. And if it's too hard to say those, then you just say the name of Jesus. It's the most perfect prayer there is. Just say, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Just right now, just feel it bubble up in your heart, bubble up in your chest, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I need you, Jesus. I praise you, Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit.